Chapter 9, Introduction to Hypothesis Testing. In this video, we'll learn how to develop a decision rule for testing a hypothesis, as well as how to conduct hypothesis testing for population means. So in our textbook, there are three approaches to conduct a hypothesis test. The first is to calculate a Z or T test statistic and compare it to a critical value or cutoff point. The second is to calculate the sample mean and compare it to a critical mean. And the third is to calculate the p-value and compare it to the chosen alpha. We will not cover the second method. Now a test statistic is a function of the sampled observations that provides a basis for testing a statistical hypothesis. In other words, we're going to use the sample data to calculate a test statistic and use it to make a decision. So how do we make those decisions? The purpose of a hypothesis test is to use sample information to decide whether or not to reject the null hypothesis about a population parameter. To do this, we need to select a cutoff point. Kind of like when you take a class as pass-fail, there's a particular grade or cutoff point that will determine whether or not you pass the class. In other words, we need to create a decision rule with a cutoff point. So for instance, right here is our decision rule that if our sample mean is greater than some cutoff point, we would reject the null. Or if it's not greater than our cutoff point, we do not reject the null. And this would be our decision rule when we're working with a one-tailed, upper-tailed test here. If our sample is less than or equal to the cutoff point, we would not reject the null because we do not have enough evidence to state otherwise. So we'd be in this part of our curve. The significance level right here is the maximum allowable probability of committing a type 1 statistical error. This is denoted by alpha. And so in the previous video, we learned what type 1 errors are. These are false positives, where we believe that the alternative hypothesis is true when it's not. So the decision maker of the test gets to choose our alpha or significance level. This is based on how costly the error is in business. So if making a type 1 error is very costly, we would want a small alpha value. If it's not very costly and we can afford to make the error, we would allow for a higher alpha value. The chosen alpha has a corresponding cutoff point known as the critical value. So you can see the relationship right here where our alpha is this shaded area that we're looking for, and the cutoff is where that alpha begins. This cutoff is known as the critical value. This is the z-value, or t-value, based on the significance level that determines whether or not we reject the null. We've talked about z-values and t-values before in Chapter 8, where the z-value is when we know the population standard deviation, and the t-value is when we don't. To conduct a hypothesis test for population means, the method that we'll first learn is to calculate a test statistic and compare it to our critical value or our cutoff value. So when we know the population standard deviation, we will calculate a Z test statistic, this formula right here, which you learned how to do in chapter seven. This should look familiar. Co again, the common error people will make is how we input this formula into our calculator. So it's helpful to remember that the top here is our sampling error, where we take our sample mean minus our hypothesized population mean, and then we divide that number by our standard error in the denominator, which is the population standard deviation that's given to us that we know, divided by the square root of our sample size, or our n. Once we find our z test statistic, we will compare it to a critical z value. To find the critical value z when the population standard deviation is known for our decision making process, you can either use the appendix F for commonly used critical values, which you can find in the last row at the very bottom of the appendix in the infinity row, or you can use Excel. So the first thing we want to do is determine if we have a one tail or two tail test to find which row we're going to use at the top of the chart. one tail tests are when our alternative hypothesis shows a greater than or less than sign. A two tail test is where we have an equal sign in the null hypothesis and a not equal sign in the alternative hypothesis.
Once you've identified if it's a one-tail or two-tailed, you'll go across until you find the alpha value that's stated in the problem. Say for our two-tail test, our alpha is 0.1. Then you'll move down that column to the very bottom row in our appendix where there's the infinity symbol, and that will show us the corresponding z value for our hypothesis test, or 1.645. Now, to read our appendix F for a critical t value when we don't know the population standard deviation, the first step is still the same. We have to determine is it a one tail or two tail test. Then we'll go across to find the alpha value stated in the problem. Say this time we are looking at a one tailed upper tail test and the alpha value is 0 0.01. So I'm over here at 0 0.01. So we'll need to determine our degrees of freedom by taking n minus 1. And so our degrees of freedom are here on the left side where say my uh, sample size is 6, so 6 minus 1 is 5, so my degrees of freedom is 5, and moving down the column, again imagine we're a one-tailed test with a 0 0.01 alpha, we go down until we get to the fifth row, our degrees of freedom of 5, and so the corresponding t value is 3.3649. Let's go ahead and do problem 3. Here you're asked to find the relevant critical values for each of the following and I'll show you how to do it with the appendix F and Excel. So in part A, we have our alternative hypothesis states that the population mean is greater than 13. We have our sample size and a population standard deviation as well as our alpha value. So the first thing we want to do when we look at this is identify is this a one-tail or two-tail test. Since our alternative hypothesis states greater than, that means it's pointing to the upper tail of our distribution. So we're doing a one-tail test. Next, I want to look at the standard deviation. Since this is the symbol for the population standard deviation, that means we know it and we're going to be looking for a z critical value. So when using the appendix, you're going to look for the infinity row at the bottom. And then we're going to be using this alpha to find it. So in the back of your book, in the appendix F, there's this table that has your z values and t values. So if we scroll down a bit, here are the two rows we'll work with. It's either a one-tail or a two-tail test. And then as you go across, these are the possible alpha values the table has. Once you identify how many tails and which alpha value you're working with, since we know the population standard deviation, you'll scroll all the way down to the infinity row to find the critical z value. What you'll notice, though, in my Excel file I've provided, there's a small snapshot of the appendix F with an explanation of how to read it. And so, for instance, in that part A, we had a one-tail test, and our alpha was at 0 0.05. And then if I go down to the infinity row, and I make a note, this is when we know the population standard deviation, we can see that the z value is 1.6449. What we can also do is use Excel in terms of the formula. Since this is a one-tail upper tail test to the right, the greater than sign points to the right, we'll use this formula, and I'll type in equals norm.s.inv parentheses 1 minus our alpha value of 0 0.05, close out, and I get the same z value of 1.6449 as I did by reading the table. So here's the formula we just plugged into Excel, and whether you use the appendix or Excel, you should get the same answer depending on how you round. So in part B, the alternative hypothesis states that our population mean does not equal to 21. We have our sample size and we have a lowercase s which denotes the sample standard deviation and an alpha of 0 0.02. So by looking at our alternative hypothesis, we can see that this is a two-tailed test because the does not equal sign only applies for two-tailed tests. Then we want to look at the standard deviation. In this case, we only know the sample. We do not know the population standard deviation. That means we have to find a critical t value. And my little hint here is that when we're looking for t values, we need to find the degrees of freedom, which is our n minus 1. So taking our n of 23 minus 1, I know I'm going to be working with 22 degrees of freedom. So going to our appendix F, we had our two-tail test. So I look at the two-tail row. And our alpha, if I go all the way, was 0 0.02. And then I'm going to scroll down until I get to row 22, because our degrees of freedom was n minus 1. At row 22, I get 
if we do it in Excel, because we don't know the population standard deviation, I'm looking for a t value, and it's a two-tailed test, I can use this formula here, equals t dot inv dot 2t parentheses, our probability, which is the same thing as our alpha, is 0 0.02, comma, and our degrees of freedom was 22. Close out, and I also get 2.5083. Now note, with the two-tail test, that means I have critical values on both sides. That means I need a positive and a negative t-value. So when we write the critical t-values, we'll put a plus or minus in front of the value that we get from the table or from Excel. In Part C, the alternative hypothesis states that our population mean does not equal to 35. We have a sample size and a population standard deviation based on our sigma symbol right here and our alpha of 0.01. First, we want to ask ourselves, is this a one or two-tail test? Since we have a do not equal symbol, that means we've got a two-tail test. And then looking at our standard deviation, we know the population standard deviation. So that means I'm going to be looking for a z value. So I want to find that infinity row in our appendix F, or I can use Excel. So for our two-tail test, at an alpha of 0.01, and going down to my infinity row, our z value is 2.5758. And if I wanted to use Excel, here's my two-tail test when I know the population standard deviation. So we're looking for a z value. I'll type in equals norm dot s dot inv parentheses, our alpha of 0 0.01 divided by 2, because we've got two tails. Close the parentheses and hit enter, and I get negative 2.5758. Note that in this formula, it'll start from left to right. That's why it gives you the negative first. But I put a little note here to remind you that for any two-tailed test, you have to have a positive and a negative critical value. So whether you use the Appendix F or Excel, you know that you must have a negative and positive critical value for a two-tailed test. So we'll write plus or minus 2.5758. Let's go ahead and do a problem on your worksheet. So we've got Stone Brewing uses an automatic filling machine set so that the mean fill volume is 16 ounces for their go-to IPA. The machine has a known standard deviation of 0.422 ounces with a fill distribution that is normally distributed. To check if the machine is correctly filling with a mean of 16 ounces, a random sample of n equals 49 cans was selected. The sample mean from these 49 cans was found to be 16.2 ounces. Conduct the hypothesis test at a significance level of 0 0.10. So the first thing we have to do is looking at our story, we have to figure out is this a one-tail or two-tail test. With a one-tail test, you're going to be looking for language that either tells you greater than or less than. But as you can see, we don't have any language like that at all. In addition, if we think about the context of filling a can at 16 ounces, we want a good machine that fills correctly. So we don't want the can overfilling or underfilling. So this implies that our hypothesis test is going to be a two-tailed test. We want our null hypothesis to state that our population mean is 16 ounces, and the alternative is when it doesn't equal 16 ounces. If it turns out the alternative is true, then we know we have to fix the machine. So finding all of our pieces before we get into the problem solving aspect, the alpha, or the significance level, was given to us at 0 0.10. Our sample size, or our n, is the 49 cans we're inspecting. The population standard deviation is known at 0 0.422. And the sample mean that we obtained from our sample of 49 cans was 16.2 ounces. So in part A, we need to first state the decision rule. We will reject the null if the calculated value of our test statistic z is greater than the critical value blank or less than the critical value blank. And you can use appendix F or Excel. Otherwise, do not reject. So going to Excel, since we have a two-tailed test, we're going to go across to the alpha value of 0 0.1 and go down to the infinity row because we do know the population standard deviation. So it's 1.6449. So the two critical values we'll enter in our decision rule is the 1.645 positive for the upper tail 
and negative 1.645 in the lower tail. And if you prefer to use Excel, you could have used this formula right here. Next in part B, we need to find the calculated value of our test statistic. So we need to convert our sample mean of 16.2 into a Z value. So you did this in chapter 7, where we'll take our sample mean of the 16.2 ounces minus our hypothesized population mean of 16 ounces that we want in our cans. And then in the bottom is our standard error. So there's my population standard deviation divided by our square root of our sample size of 49 cans. Now to avoid errors in the order of operations, you want to do these separately. So my sampling error on top is 0 0.2 and my standard error in the bottom is 0 0.0603. So double check with your calculator that you get the same results as I do, and that'll let you know whether or not you're entering it incorrectly into your calculator. Now I'll go ahead and divide our sampling error by our standard error, and I get 3.32 for my test statistic. So for our critical value method, what we have to do now is compare our part B test statistic against our part A critical value. So here are critical values. These are the cutoff points we identified in part A based off of our alpha value. So 1.645 and negative 1.645. And we can see that our test statistic part B is out here in the tail because 3.32 is to the right of 1.645. So I like to visualize to see where my test statistic and my critical values compare. And because our test statistic 3.32 is greater than our critical value of 1.645, we will reject the null and conclude that the population mean is not equal to 16. So what does this mean for stone brewing? What can we conclude? It means that our machine is not filling correctly because we rejected the null. And if you were a production manager, what should you do?